Hey, so we have an epic episode for you today. We're joined by Arjuna O'Neill, and this man is a men's leadership coach. He works inner city, helping police, gang members, build bridges, come together. He's doing such deep and powerful work. And hey, most of our audience is a warrior class themselves, which mean that these are men and women who are, are willing to sacrifice themselves for something greater than themselves. And so we traditionally think of this as police fire veteran, but there's also a, an entirely different set of culture. And this is the inner city. These are people who are born into trauma, have been initiated into the warrior culture and are dealing with the same post-traumatic stress issues that those of us in the military are. So this is a great man who has had an epiphany himself, has died and came back, and is bringing some of those lessons of the wounded healer that the rest of us are caring for in honor to have Arjuna O'Neill on this episode. So you don't want to miss it. Tune in. All right, y'all, welcome to the uh, Winner Folsom podcast, your source for battle-tested leadership and resiliency. And we have an epic show and an epic guest for y'all today. Yeah, I am so grateful to welcome our guest, Arjuna O'Neill. He is a really close buddy of mine, and I have so much respect for the work he does. Just a couple things to kick it off. This man has been shot and come back to life. Uh, he does deep, deep work working in like, Compton's helping people in gangs uh, really find resiliency and come together and create community. He works with inner city youth. Like he is on the front lines, deep in the heart of where our culture and our communities need it most. And we're going to have a really fun conversation for you today. So Arjuna, so grateful for you to be with us. Thank you. Thank you both for the kind words and the introduction. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here and a privilege and a pleasure. Hmm. Don't take it lightly. <laughs> You know, I, I wanted to kick it off first with uh, just a little bit of people can understand the context of the work you do. I think it's really important to understand. Uh, I know we were just talking the other day and you were talking about, you know, what it's like. And I don't think everybody always understands what it's like. And just from a what we talk a lot about here on resiliency and people living in high states of stress. And we you and I have had a lot of conversations because just like fire, police, military, Certain members that live in high stress regularly are constantly in a hypervigilant state and what that does to the nervous system. And, you know, your work is very similar when you're working with gang members and you're working with people that are in an environment that's hypervigilant. So maybe it'd be really helpful to share a little bit of your experience so people know the world you walk into and the types of work that you're helping people start to become aware of and just the, to give a little bit of compassion of the world that's going on when people are living in that state. Yeah, well, thank you for presence in that. And what I've learned is that uh, outside, internally, we're all the same. And my near-death experience taught me that. You know, being shot, dying, and coming back, I learned underneath it all, I got to meet paramedics that cared more about me than the so-called homies and the friends. I met officers that showed a level of compassion and kindness in that, in that state of condition that showed up for me more than the friends and the homies and the, even family members. So it really changed my perspective, right? Because when I was shot, I remember laying there. And at that time I was a street entrepreneur. So I was, I was in a drug facility that I had created, established. And at that time when I was dying, I remember hearing someone from the neighborhood basically ask, is he dead yet? And where could we find, you know, the stash? And I was like, wow, but yet, you know, the things that we see in our society, uh, the way sometimes things are portrayed in terms of police and, 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 and help and service care providers, all these things, is that you know there is a system and certain things are flawed and all those things. But when I had my own personal experience where I felt the compassion and the kindness, it allowed me to know that there was more. There's something to go deeper into and start looking at these things and unpack it. And from that point forward, I really wanted to know. I really wanted to learn all the myths and the, and the stereotypes. I wanted to have access to that and help other people understand that, you know, the way we perceive the world in our own, from our own experiences, interpretations is literally the reality that we create and we look for those things. So in terms of the work, uh, for me, I just take the message. I've been the bridge 
And all I do is help people see things from a different perspective, right? You've been taught to look at things one way this way your whole life, but what if, right? Just what if you open your mind to a different perspective? Not saying you have to believe it, accept it, or be attached to it, but just give yourself the option to see things differently. If you know that this way has only brought you stress, anxiety, closed, a closed heart. So let me use my story and my voice, an experience that you can relate to, and show that actually this is something that all humans are going through. You cannot live life and feel that you can be exempt from life, life in you is something that I like to say. Yeah. So we just help, for me, it's, let me remind you that you have a heart, especially when you talk about men. Right? Yeah, and so, um, and, and to give a little bit deeper, so the, those that are listening can really relate to it. So like as a, an example, like I remember you telling me stories about whether you're in Detroit or whether you're in Los Angeles and Compton or certain areas, you, you go into high gang neighborhoods, right? Yeah. So maybe give a little bit of that perspective so people can actually understand high gang neighborhoods where there's gangs against each other and actually create peace between two rival yeah. gangs, right? Like, if, like really try to understand what <laughs> the work you're doing, where you're risking your own life. And that's yeah. our definition of a warrior, somebody who is willing to serve something greater and it comes at a potential cost of giving their life to do it. So you're essentially doing the same thing. You're going into high gang neighborhoods with the risk of your life to bring peace to yeah. these heavy cultures. So maybe just give an example of what that may look like so somebody can really get that. Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't wanna take all the credit uh, for making that shift. You know, I, I had to really, well, basically, when they say you have to hit rock bottom, I had to die to come back to get this perspective. Uh, don't recommend that for anybody who's looking to do this type of work. Don't, you don't have to take it that far to the extreme. <laughs> but um, so when you, like I said, once I had that experience, dying and coming back. I couldn't lie to myself anymore. Right? I couldn't make up any more stories about, well, this is all I know because this is where I was raised and this is where I come from. Okay, fair enough. I get it. For some of us, that is. We only knew the abusive background of a parent who was drinking or whatever the case may be, or toxic relationships, or whatever your story is, wherever you come from. There is that, but then there's a point where you have experiences, where life will show you that there's something else. Now it's up to you to choose them. Do I want to stay in this? Do I want to do the inner work to change that? And if I do, what does that take? Right? That will look different for every human being. So when I had that experience, all my family is still in these communities. My family still lives in those environments. So what do I do? I, do I cut my family off? Do I no longer engage with family because I have elevated my consciousness and changed the way I think, my perception about life? So do, do I cut my family off? No. I just figured out I had to learn a way. I had to learn a way to still be me, be true to my, my, my newfound consciousness, my way of being, the way I'm thinking, but also not see my family and the people that I used to interact with as a virus or something bad, right? Where can I find the compassion? Because I used to be that, right? Where can I find the understanding? Where can I open up the platform so someone else can have the same opportunity that I had? Right? A lot of times we think that people don't want to change. It's not that, right? If I, if I asked you, like, if you had to choose, Joshua, to wake up and go out and be on the, the coast of the beach and enjoy the sunshine or hang out in an environment where people are on drugs and all these things, most likely you're going to choose the path that sounds more fulfilling and, and of enjoyment. But if you don't have access to that, just within your being, if you if that's something that's not ex your, your consciousness is exposed to on a daily basis, you're going to choose what's around you. Mm. Period. And I'm saying that for anyone that's listening that may not come from that background, may not understand. And you know, from the outside looking in, it's like, well, why would you choose that? I used to ask myself the same thing. When I reflect back, we've had conversations. When I look back at the things that I used to do, I was like, wow, or just like, man, what made you choose that? Why did you allow yourself to get caught up in these types of experiences? And what I learned was that even as a child, as a young boy growing up, I didn't like violence. I didn't like half of the things that I chose, but I didn't have anyone that could help me understand why I was in this position, how to look at it, how to walk through it, how to start even breaking it down and make sense of my life. And everything around me, it seemed to work. My father was uh, at the time part of one of the, you know, 
the biggest drug rings that was going on in the 80s in Detroit. So it wasn't just something that I saw when I woke up and went outside. I was trained or was taught to be that way. So just like some of the, the, the men that you guys support, right? Former vets, trained to be militant soldiers. So when you're trained, it hits different, right? It lands different. You show up in a whole nother frame of mind versus you just stumbled into this experience, right? And so from the outside looking in, it's easy to assume that when I see a former vet, a warrior, oh, he must be just hard all the way in and hard all the way out. Like, we don't understand that even behind that, there's still a man with a heart, there's still a human being, right? There's still a person in there. And you have to look at it from a perspective, just like somebody who chooses a profession. They chose to go into that. So if I'm choosing to go into this, good or bad, I'm one of those types of people that's gonna show up fully. What I've learned in these environments, most people just didn't have anyone to show them, not say it, it's one thing to say it, but show them that someone that looked like me did the same things you did, experienced the same consequences, but also understood that when I take accountability and say that I really want something different, I'll do whatever it takes to change that. And so that's where I show up. I remind people that, hey, mostly men predominantly, but I remind people that, hey, look, you have a heart and it's not just only to keep you alive. You know, that's a question I ask men all the time. What do you think the heart is there for? Why do we have hearts beyond just it beating and keep you alive as a man? Powerful. I really love where you're going with this because a lot of the work we do is, you know, I think our job as men, as we start to elevate ourselves is to father ourselves first, which is a lot of what I'm hearing in your story. You had to father yourself. And then on that fathering yourself, you, now you're essentially becoming a guide or a mentor to help father other men that didn't have another perspective. And I really feel like that's our job as men doing men's work. And I know you're also leading men's work and helping men. And that's a lot of what we're seeing in our communities is we didn't have a lot of father figures. There wasn't a lot of healthy father figures. And instead there was a lot of shadow father figures that multiple generations back that, that learned either no father or a father that was heavy in his shadows. Um, and we, that we learned that's what a man is. And so that's our map. This is what we're trained to do. And that's what we become. And then we're just in this world. So I really like the metaphor of that's where all of us start, right? So anybody listening, you may be asking like, what maps have you learned? You know, what, yeah. what model of the world are you using? How are you navigating it? And what would it look like if you want a different life? What kind of mentor, advisor, communities, support, like who's living the life you want and how do you start to get around other men that can start to show you new maps, new ways to navigate through the world? Yeah, yeah, love it, yeah. You know, we talk about this a few times, Joshua. Uh, it's easy to step back, paint a picture and then just put something on it, a label on it and just say, well, I don't go there because of this. You know, in terms of just relationship relating with another man. One thing and the reason why I brought the heart up and brought the heart into this, we don't talk about the heart as men in that language, right? We have our own code words for when we want to be vulnerable in that way, which is fine. But what I've learned is that when it comes to men, men only feel safe with another man who actually exposes some part of his heart. We don't talk about that. Now, he may not show his whole heart, but I'm only going to feel safe with another man when I know that he's let me in to a part of his world that I know that men don't usually share. And so that's why I talk about the heart work a lot. As men, we don't speak about it, but if there's any men that are listening and you feel closed off, because once you close your heart, you close off all the other possibilities beyond just feeling, emotions. There's so much there that the heart knows, the heart understands that the heart can lead us and guide us in. When we don't have the emotional intelligence, when we don't have the vocabulary to express our feelings, I rely on the heart because here is gonna keep me in the story. It's gonna keep me in all the looping and, 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 and the old beliefs, self-doubt, all the things. So I remind myself, okay, Arjun, even if you don't have the communication at this point, maybe you don't have the words, just trust the heart right now. I need you to, because the heart knows. The heart is going to be, when it comes to men particularly, 
The heart is actually is what keeps us able to do this dance because we can get up here real quick, come up with a story and keep it pushing. So it's a heart language. The work that I actually bring into the community, it's, it's, it's reminding other hearts that we're all connected. And if we live from that space, there's a whole nother way of being in this world versus what we see in our society. Yeah, gold. Thank you. I got a, I got a couple. It's so just fascinating. And Arjun, I haven't got to hang out with you, but I'm an anthropologist and I've, I've got to travel around. And uh, so the okay. initiation uh, stories from men are really, really important for me because I, I was not initiated until I went to the army. And that okay. was a, that's what they call a shadow initiation. Because I got re I got introduced to, you know, the warrior code, like you did, you were trained, you know, and I was I was trained, I was jumped into a certain code, that was missing a few vital pieces. That's your heart, right? Yeah. So it's an incomplete initiation process. All of those. Unfortunately, there is no um, stats or studies done on inner city suicide rates, mental health rates. It's a missing, you know, just vacuum of yeah. what's going on in culture. We know the veteran stats really well. Yeah, we know the police stats. We know fire stats. We know all that warrior culture. Yeah. And inner city male culture is a warrior culture. I've always seen that. And I've just seen the, you know, the classic post-traumatic stress symptoms are just rampant yes. you know, in that culture. So it really sounds like what you're doing is you're reinitiating or reintroducing this warrior culture. You're completing their initiation process. Because what a wonderful thing to take a bunch of powerful, capable, assertive men and then add that that piece, right? The heart yeah. piece. Better than taking men with no initiation, which right. is what a lot of the civilian world, is. these are men who are completely fucking lost. Right. Like they have no idea what masculinity is, honor is, um, identity, code, yeah. ethics, hustle. Like that's that shit is all there in the inner city in the same way that they're in the military communities. Yeah. All we got to do is add that final piece so that the engine runs. Yeah. And it, and that sounds like what, you know, kind of the journey you're on. And, you know, obviously you're, you're, you know, you're Arjuna, your name and the Bhagavad Gita and <laughs> meditation and all that. Is that part of your, is the mindfulness part of your um, healing or initiation process with these young men? Yes. Yes. Actually the whole, everything you just dropped into here, Philip, is, is gold. Um, I want to go back to the part. And then I'll answer that question to where you, you spoke to what's already available in inner city culture, men, predominantly what we're talking about right now, primarily. Um, mm. Yeah, I was already all these things. The consciousness is what needed to level up, right? All I did was take the same skill sets that helped me save my life, right? The same things that I was doing that was, <clears throat> I guess, pushing me further into the darkness when I realized that I could shift it and move it towards the light. I was like, wow, shit, if I can do this, then I can, there's a whole lineup of men that we could use in mm. service, right? But first I had to get me together. So I left Detroit, came to LA, did the beach life, did, did all the, you know, the, the, the fun in the sun and all of the uh, disconnecting from that trauma and pain for a while, I just had to find myself. Hey, and Arjuna, where'd you live? Sorry to interrupt you. Where'd you live in LA? Uh, <laughs> Santa Monica, Venice area. Yeah, that, okay. that was that. I, I'm in Venice right now. Oh, okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm in I'm in Oakwood, Sixth and Brooks. Ah, whoa! I was on Sixth. <laughs> Wait, I'm, I, I just said, you, yeah. I used to live on the corner of Sixth and Brooks. No, literally. I promise you, right? At, well, I've been uh, yeah. I've been here for thirty years, so you know what yeah. you know what we're talking about. Yeah. So I, yeah. Well, since we're gonna go there, yeah. I had my first on, introduction was, uh, with the Shoreline Crips. There you go, man. I was here in that whole Culver City boy. I'm, I'm right. Up, I'm on the corner, bro. So, and that's, it, it's, it's fun that we get to talk about that because see, the way society has us look at these, these things, you know, we don't even talk about how LA, even though it's the land of the, you know, the milk and honey or to find yourself and create your, your mm -hmm. dreams or live that dream life. It's built on gang culture. Yeah. Multi-generational. Yeah. So it goes. It, and when you say street um, entrepreneur, that's fucking it. People don't understand. It is. This is just. It's like if you're a an immigrant from Italy, 
Yeah. You do what you do have to do. It's yeah. called prohibition, right? Or if you're a poor Southern boy, you're running moonshine. You're doing, yeah. I mean, it's a very accepted cultural phenomenon, you know? Yeah. Well, you learn it's all the, across the board. When we really take all the titles and the things off of it, it's all the same. It's mm -hmm. all the same. A lot of it's all the same in terms of mindset and in terms of like the agenda. We'll say that. But all that to say, you know, moving forward, when I realized that there were plenty of able bodies that could transform their lives like I did, and I saw how to do it, because you know, we're taught that things from the past that actually were our survival techniques, it's bad. Like, oh, that you can't use that, you know, anymore because you don't live that life. So you have to disassociate everything from your past and be this whole new person. And I was in so much confusion and self-agony trying to make it make sense. But I'm like, but it can't necessarily be bad if I take myself or take the experience out of the environment that it is and put it in, just be neutral with it, I can see the benefits in it. So I started teaching and sharing these perspectives with former gang members, active gang members, former gang, I mean, former drug dealers or active drug dealers. Like, hey, not to say anything is wrong here. Let me just paint a picture. You're living like this. You're feeling like this. You've done this for so long and you still don't have the results that you say you want about your life. So let me share some things with you. I'm not here to tell you anything. Let me just share some experiences that I've had. And let me know if they resonate. And if something resonates and it makes sense to you, then let's talk about how that needs, to, what can we do next? See how that looks. So I'll give you one example real quick. Then we can go into wherever this flows, Josh. When I opened my community center at South Central, I was greeted by the community. Like, hey, you're an outsider. Cool. What's your purpose here? And I told them, I said, I'm literally here to give your children a different experience than what we're currently living. And it was like, oh, well, that's different. I didn't tell them I was here to change the community or do all the things, just, just here to create a different experience for your children. That's a hard one to argue. Okay, well, what does that look like? What are you doing? First of all, there's a direct correlation between the mental and emotional state and the food that we're eating. Food deserts and half the inner city environments, not just in LA, but across the board. So if you want me to be able to regulate my nervous system, take a moment to find stillness, sit still, my body has to be able to meet me there. So now I got to look at what am I feeling my body with? So we started a program where we started bringing fresh organic produce into the community. And then from there, we didn't do anything else. Let me fill the bodies up with the right fuel first. So for about a year, that's all we did. Changing the way people we're able to connect with their body. So now I can start talking about your nervous system. Now I can start talking to you about, about the body. And you understand certain things, how you feel, how you move. And then we went from there. It was like, okay, now that we have this established, I'm not saying that you guys need to stop being gang members, but what if you took your gang, the first gang that showed other gang members how to be community oriented, right? How do you make sure all of your homies and their grandmothers and their grandparents and their children have access to this fresh produce too. So their kids can go to school and, right? Because we all understand any of us that come from a violent background or traumatic background, we all understand that that's not something we want our kids or our family members to experience. But if you go directly to the person with that, and I already don't believe that I have an opportunity or I already feel that life is already throwing things at me or holding me down, I'm, it's hard for me to receive that. But if you help me see it through another content, I can't see it for myself, but I can definitely see it for my children. I'm open. And so basically that's, that's the formula. Hey, we thank you for listening to the Winner Folsom podcast. Just a couple quick notes. First, if you are a man and you're looking for an honorable and inspiring group of men to hold you accountable and challenge you to grow in your relationships, your fitness, your career, your finances, and your life, go to www.k4men.com. And if you are a veteran, first responder, or man or woman who deals with trauma, and you are looking for some resiliency tools and skills for you, your team, or your organization, go to valorresiliency.com. Hope to see you there. Back to the podcast. And then from that space of 
getting the body the right proper nutrients, aligning with the future generation of children, starting yeah. to create community, really core aspects of it. Is that when you were able to start saying, hey, let me translate what I've seen you do brilliantly is take the same resiliency protocol that we're doing to translate to fire, police, military. Like let's, let's take all these principles that typically a therapist will throw in your face that you feel disconnected from. And Hey, we're veterans. We're walking with you. We got the same shit you got and yeah. let's translate it. Cause we're actively, that's why we call this battle tested. Cause we're battle testing it on us and so many men on a regular basis, men and women to get results and what actually works and what it does work. Let's create a, a language or a framework that you can start to relate to so that you can now start to go, Oh, I can interact with this in a language that makes sense to me. Is, did you do the same essentially framing to say, okay, let me take meditation. Let me take breath work. Let me take things that would typically be like, fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> and let me reframe it in a way that you can receive it based on, you know, your background, your training, that your view of the world. Perfect. Yeah. An example of that, just to, so you you have a very clear understanding of how it works, is I would use the story of, I think I share with you, Joshua, in terms of police training, right? You have a sergeant or someone who's been on the force far more many years than the rookie or the new officer, right? Well, if I've been on this force for the past 30 years and all I've heard and seen in this particular community is violence and death and what it appears to be as heartless and nobody cares, right? I don't live in this community, but this is what I'm saying. This is my perspective based on the phone calls, the calls that we're getting and the type of cases that we're dealing with. So in my mind, it's my job, right? To tell this rookie officer, first and foremost, your primary objective is safety, survival. In these environments, this is what it's like. Your job is to survive first. So I'm gonna teach you everything that it takes to survive in these types of environments. Take that same concept from the gang concept, right? From the gang mindset, the OG is going to tell the youngin, right? What's the protocol? If you, if you sign up with us, first thing, your primary focus is survival. We know where survival is in the body. We know this, but the average person doesn't. The average civilian doesn't understand that. Survival is the sympathetic nervous system which is fight, flight, freeze, or survive. In that state, especially under conflict, you're not thinking rational solutions. And the body is going to do something beyond your mind. You know, we see the sympathetic nervous system usually is talked about from a negative aspect, or it's not a good thing, but the sympathetic nervous system is a powerful thing. It can save your life. It literally helps save lives. It's just not being translated in that way. So I was able to take those two narratives and help Gang members understand why law enforcement is showing up this way, despite all the other stuff, but just the core. And then I would help do trainings with like 77 Division Police Department. I would help law enforcement see it from that perspective, from the streets. Now we both have an understanding of where to start with this. When I see you, I'm in survival. When you see me, you're in survival. Neither one of us are in our cognitive behavior mechanism, like nothing's working here. Only thing I know is that I was taught by my elder to survive and I was taught by my elder to survive. What does that look like on the battlefield? <laughs> we know what that breeds. So helping first have the idea that when I pull up or when you pull up or when I pull up or when you pull up either side, the first uh, approach is to see this as I'm at battle and I need to survive. Like not even questioning, well, why are you here? What's, what's going on? This is a job. This is what I'm supposed to do. Uh, this is what you're not supposed to be doing. None of that is even brought into the, the conversation until sometimes it's too late or, or after we have an experience. And so these things keep happening, right? When we see some of these movies uh, about warriors, uh, soldiers that go over and there are certain things that happen and you know I, I listened to the podcast I mean not podcast but the book Extreme uh, Leadership and I forget the other guy's name but that book it really talks and it really helps you understand the way we're trained on the battlefield is at all costs I'm going to do everything to make sure my team or my platoon is safe 
That's the same mindset that the streets have at all costs. Now, one is considered of honor, one's considered of negative or toxic behavior. But we don't start there. We don't even start to ask those types of questions. So Gold, I, I think anybody listening can start to understand why we're having so many problems. And and, and I know we've had a lot of conversations around um, all the things happening from, you know, with police and, and racial things that are happening. There's like so many things. And Arjun and I have luckily been able to unpack a lot of this together and help each other understand different perspectives. And it's been a really like healing conversation to get different perspectives. And, and again, we're all doing the same thing. That's why I love this conversation because we're all going into warrior-based communities and we're teaching how to become aware of the body, the nervous system, um, how to become aware when you're activated or in a hypervigilant or survival state, how to use very back, uh, very science-based, research-based tools to actually put you into regulated states, which Arjuna stated, get you into compassion, empathy, and rational thinking. And if yeah. you're not able to access that, you literally are operating under your training, which is pure survival. But if you're yeah. able to flip a switch, yeah. you're able to get regulated and you're able to deescalate situations from any side that you're on. And the beauty of it is that the training that we're talking about, we're using this in the context of uh, our junior was using it like police and let's say gang members in that environment. But here's, here's the deeper piece. A lot of times we take that home. And so mm. fire, so. police, veterans, gangs, any, but any warrior that lives in survival States usually doesn't know how to reintegrate back home because they have no awareness that they're even in an activated state 24 seven with survival. And so they actually come home and end up destroying their families. They end up in high states of anger, rage, anxiety, depression, all these different symptoms, which are the mental, big mental health conversation. That's a massive problem, which is why suicide is the number one cause of death with fire, police, military. I imagine it's a big problem in inner city. And I know Arjuna, you've talked a lot, even just about, you know, black men and the suicide rates of how much higher that is in general. And so this is a massive ep epidemic happening. And, and, yeah. they don't, and a lot of this, the suicide rates, um, that's just classic, you know, gun in the mouth. They're not yeah. talking about de uh, suicide by cop, you know, ooh, OD, oh, crashed his car. There's, there's an exponential amount of just um, nihilism, you know, of, which really is a form of suicide. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's rampant. I've, I've always um, looked at, uh, you know, the veteran or police conversation is kind of like they're the uh, the canary in the coal mine, that little bird that dies first yeah. and kind of warns the rest of the people like, oh, shit, there's something bad. And that's all of us. Yeah. Now, people in the inner city are also canary in the coal mine because it's not staying there. That poison gas is not staying and clinical anxiety and addiction, depression, so, like it's in the population. It has jumped the, the firewalls. It's in the rest of us. So yeah. at some point, people should start taking a look at what are some of the survival protocols that we're using because you're going to need them real soon. It, yeah. I mean, we're looking at suicide rates down in, in middle school skyrocketing. So take a look at what's going on right now with this type of programming because it's going to save our ass. It's literally, for me, it's, it's the only way out or the one, only way through. You know, you bring a very good uh, good point, Philip. And thank you for sharing what you shared, Joshua. It's everywhere. And something that I I, I talk about when I do uh, I do these lectures at uh, Loyola Marymount uh, on social change, social justice, and one of the narratives that I share that usually ruffles feathers, but when I break it down, people get it. When I was a street entrepreneur, I had big goals, just like I do with my business now. You know, big goals. I dream big. So. I didn't want any of the nickel dime customers. I wanted people that had money, who had a sustainable job. And so most of my clients that came through were from the affluent communities. They were from the white suburban communities. So when you say that, I, I'm saying this to talk about the, the correlation, how, because we don't see that, we don't talk about that. So it seems that, that this stuff is only happening in these underserved or marginalized communities, right? But you don't hear affluent people coming on or making videos or talking about, yeah, well, you know, half of our kids are going to get all their drugs from the inner city and they, they hang out. See, that's where the youth are at. Hey, Arjuna, I can tell you the people on, coming through my corner. Yeah. You know, back back in the, the 90s and 2000s, mm -hmm. all, all white. Yeah. 
And yeah, that was that was the that was the yeah. through line. And so what I help people understand, and not to say it from who's good or bad, right? It's just to show that this is why this work is so important because we're all connected. It's still all connected. We're all connected. So how do I use my story to connect the dots and teach and share with anyone? Because I feel like we're all here. All three of us are here because we chose this, right? This is a chosen path, right? Based on what we've experienced in our lives, based on the hurt and all the stuff that we saw and the darkness that we saw, we know how that feels internally in our own being. And when you have just a little bit of compassion, right? If you just have a little bit, you can understand or empathy. You're like, man, if this feels like this to me, why would I want the next person to go through this? Especially if you've never done me any harm, regardless of what you look like, right? Why would I, why would I want a child to have this experience? Yeah. And, and I, I know a big, big piece for me too, is, you know, this is really the purpose-based work moving from self, which I think is that survival state is just trying to survive because I'm caught in myself and mm -hmm. converting that to service is really turning that pain into purpose and meaning. Yeah. And, and that really, when we start to convert our pain into purpose, it starts to create meaning for all the suffering, all the pain, because you see that translated through the people's lives that start, when they come back to life, there's yeah. nothing greater than seeing somebody else that's been in the dark and all of a sudden finds a way out and they yeah. come back to life. They start to integrate the tools. They start to use them daily. They rep them. And then they, they transform their life. They heal their, their homes. They heal themselves. They yeah. get rid of addictions. I mean, I'm a, I'm a class for all these things of what I've been doing is just applying the same tools. I'm walking. We're all walking with the men and women that we're showing the way we're walking it with them. It's not like we're saying, here's the way we're saying, I'm walking it with you. I've struggled and I still struggle and I'm overcoming my struggles. And yeah. so I know this works if you rep it. And so there's nothing greater than seeing somebody else you know, elevate their life. I remember there was one comment a guy made in our community that um, after doing a lot of intense work and going inward, and like you said, facing some of those inner pieces to do the healing, to transition from where we were to who we're becoming. Yeah. And once he did it, he became really present. He had more capacity. He started being present with his kids and his family. And he said he was a, he had an ex-wife and the kids would go back and forth. And he said, this is the first time my kids have been like, we don't want to leave. And yeah. it, what it, what it showed was he'd become so present in their lives. They, they felt seen and heard and loved. And it was just such a pivotal moment of like, that's the ripple that we're doing. And to your point earlier, it's not about us, right? It's about our yeah. future generations. It's about our families, it's about our kids. And that was yeah. such a pivotal moment of like, oh, he's doing the work. And now his kids are going to have a different life, which changes our trajectory. And yeah. I know, Philip, you've said this a lot, and it, it, I think it's, it really resonates with me is men are, I think inherently in our culture, men are the problem. And we're also the solution because yeah. we create a lot of the problems. And by us doing the work, we can lead in a yeah. new direction to start to heal our communities. Yeah. I shared a post the other day. I said, dude, a man who can live and speak from his heart, that's the most powerful version of the man, you know, because you have all the other things. Plus you have now the man that can go inward and who can listen from the emotional body, right? There's we can listen with our ears and we can listen with our emotional body. And something that I just want to say that keeps jumping out in terms of this work or the service work, there's a fulfillment that happens when you serve other people, right? It's an automatic system. But what also happens is when someone else has been in that ring of fire for so long and you help them get out of it, what we see comes back is the gratitude of like, man, thank you for lifting the veil off of my eyes and you automatically want to give that experience to the next human right and so there's an idea that let me save the whole world right that's what my challenge was i'm going to save the whole world i i left detroit i found yoga i became a certified yoga instructor trauma-informed care all these things i'm going to go back to detroit and heal the whole city now all i had to do what i realized many many years later is i'm not here to change the world if i change me right then what happens is when I move throughout the world, I change me. When I move throughout the world, I change the world around me, which makes people want to change, right? So, and I say that because some of us can get bogged down or, or burn ourselves out or even give up because we're thinking that it's about saving the whole world. No, save yourself, be the best version of you. And then when you go into the world, 
That's what you're saying the father did, right? Mm -hmm. Then we go into the world, the people benefit. Then it makes somebody else wants to do that work. So when we help these men, the gratitude that they feel for your work, Philip and Joshua, is, damn it, bro, I need to pay this for it. It felt so good. And then that happens and that's the trigger effect. So if we can just grab one person, just find one person and radically show up for them and radically change their life. But they have to choose that too. But when they do, that's, and then we just let it be the domino. Hey, I, I got what, just one line. I know you got to bounce, but I want to just corroborate in case you hadn't heard this quote, Arjuna, it, by Joseph Campbell, Hero's okay. Journey. And he says, we're not on this journey to save the world. We're on this journey to save ourselves. However, in doing so, we end up saving the world because the influence of a vital man vitalizes. And you are a vital man. Hmm. Right? We'll take, That's the game. There we'll take go. it out. I'll take it, Bill. I'll take it. Yeah. Hey, hey, real quick, before we get off, how can people learn more about you? How can they find you? What's the best way to reach out uh, to get in contact with you, Arjuna? Right now, I'm just been focusing all my attention through Instagram. Uh, I have my links there. Um, pulled the website down. So I'm not really focused on the website. I'm just connecting directly to people. You know, I'm trying to make it, uh, because of the work that we're doing, it's so serious, right? And we, we realize that body counts are going up immensely. So I just make it very simple. Reach me through Instagram, you can DM me. Um, I have my Calendly link if you need to talk or would like to just consult, hold space. Uh, need a good listening ear. I'm great at listening is what I've been told. And, uh, you know, and if from that listening, if we see that there's something that I can support you in, by all means, you know, reach out, DM me. I work with both men and women, but primarily my focus has been men. Awesome. Hey. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure having you on. And everybody listening, thanks for joining us and stay battle tested. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.